Welcome to Cram and Kirk. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. In Crammond, to begin the service, we invite people who are able to stand with us as God's Word enters the sanctuary. So if you're able, please stand with me. Good morning and welcome to those watching from home and those who will see this as a recorded message, but particularly to those who are here with us live. It's the last Sunday with the choir, so they're off for a couple of months holiday making and we look forward to hearing them sing some Beethoven today. Um, Kirk announcements are printed. We invite you to read these in your own time. You'll see that the Iona trip are having a meeting and note the date and time of that. On coffees, um, Mondays are off for a couple of Mondays and then back as normal. And the gathering space finishes on Tuesday the 4th. But there will be an opportunity to pick up tea, coffee and biscuits in the gathering space throughout the summer. You will see that the strolling group is a very slow walking group but offers fresh air some coffee and some fellowship, we would be keen if people want to join that. Sadly, two deaths to report, Catherine Gillis and Esther Reed. Catherine's funeral has taken place, it was quick, but Esther's will not be until August and we'll give further details of that. Our thoughts are with their families at this time. Flowers today are from Laura Milne, and these are all the notices other than to say you'll see a minute from the presbytery meeting right at the back of the order of service. It tells you that there was an approval of the basis of union between the congregations. More details to follow, but the presbytery have appointed a committee to come down and talk us through the nominating process. And that's the Reverend James Aiken, who's minister at St Ninian's, Kirstorfen and Brian Fowler and Karen Mackay who are elders in the presbytery. That's the Vacancy Advisory Committee. These are all the intimations. In Cram and Kirk we use the Psalms each week and today Crichton is going to lead us in the call to worship from the Psalm for today. Let us worship God by sharing in the call to worship. Teach me your way, O Lord that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love towards me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, the insolent rise up against me. A band of ruffians seek my life but they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant. Save the child of your serving maid. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be put to shame. Because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. We're going to worship God together by singing hymn 198, 
let us build a house where love can dwell. The theme of our service today is that line from the psalm, save the child of your serving maid. We stand and sing. welcome all are welcome all are welcome in this place come and be welcomed by God as we join together in our prayers please be seated Lord God our church is built with tears and joy and laughter Lord God we praise you for your love which will not fail even if we neglect and forsake you you keep seeking, waiting, reaching out, forgiving, and you will greet us with great joy when we are brought back to ourselves. Keep us true to each other, 
in the joy and promise of Christian fellowship. Keep us, your own children, living in your love, proving its depth and its worth for as long as we live. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I wonder if any of the children would be willing to come to the front. It's not a difficult thing, and in fact, I'm going to ask the adults to do it as well, but we're, we're going to pave the way. We're pathfinders. We're going to show the way to do this. So if we could come to the front and can we come up here, come up. Can we manage to take our shoes off? We're going to ask the adults to do this as well. Can we take our shoes off? That's great. Now, if it's easy to take your shoes off, please slip them off because there's a great story in the Bible about taking your shoes off. Do you know the story? I don't, don't I think, think so. I might have heard it. You might have heard it. Well, I wonder if anybody could tell me the story. I've given a clue in terms of the image. It's a clue. So <laughs> I'm hoping there's a forest of hands at this point. Do you see all these hands? We'll have to ask somebody, will we? You don't know. You don't know. Have a look. What do you think this is? What does it look like? A tree. A tree that is on? Fire. Fire, and it is not burning up. So the whole image of the Church of Scotland is it's a Latin words that go round it, but it's a tree that's on fire. It's called the burning bush, and it says, and it was not consumed. So there was a fire in the bush, and it wasn't being burnt up. And a man was out looking after some sheep, and his name was? Goodness me. <laughs> Deary me. That wasn't very good, was it? His name was Moses. Moses. Moses is an extraordinary story because as a baby, he's born into danger and they think he's going to be thrown into the river and killed. And his mother is given advice that if she puts him into a basket, and to this day, we call baskets for babies Moses baskets, and she hides the basket among the reeds. Pharaoh's daughter comes down, finds the baby, is so delighted she takes him into Pharaoh's household. But as he grows up, he's well educated, he's well fed, he's confident, he's able, but he makes a terrible mistake. He kills somebody. <laughs> and then he is an outcast. And that is why he is out in the wilderness and he is looking after sheep. But God hasn't done with Moses and he hasn't done with any of us if we've made mistakes. God appears in this burning bush and God has a word for him. And the first word is, take off your shoes. You are standing on holy ground holy ground. And God says to him an incredibly important message for the future history of the whole planet. God said, I have heard my children's cries. They are oppressed in Egypt. They are slaves and it's ruining their lives. I want you, Moses, to get yourself down to Egypt and I want you to lead the people of Israel out to their own land. So it all started with taking his shoes off. So I wonder if we've taken our shoes off, if we're just about to go on a great adventure. And the people in Cram and Kirk, everyone is about to go on a great adventure. Because we have increased our parish by 14,000 people. And there are lots and lots of children who are needing support and encouragement and care. And that has become our responsibility. And goodness me, I find that exciting and important and interesting. And that's something that we've been invited to do by the Church of Scotland. And their symbol is, you're standing on holy ground. I have a task for you. Do you think that's exciting? 
Yeah, so do I. We're going to sing a comforting hymn and then a challenging hymn. So, the comforting hymn is, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You. And we're going to sing that from the hymn book now. But those who've got your shoes off can put them back on because if we're going to go on a journey, then it's better to have your shoes on. We'll ask Simon to play and then we'll sing. comfort, let us say the word of God. The first reading today is taken from the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, chapter 21, a reading from verse 8. The child grew and was weaned, and in the day Jesus, Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian, had borne to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the maidservant into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat nearby, about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there nearby, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the, the angel of the God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid, God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand for I will make him into a great nation. 
Then God opened her eyes and she was a, saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Amen. The second reading is taken from the New Testament, St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, and reading from verse 24. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Beelzehub, how much more the members of his household? Do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I, will th what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. May God bless to us the reading and hearing of his holy word. And to his name be all glory and praise. Amen. Today, uh, 
are some of the more challenging in the whole of the lecture cycle and so the message has to deal with those. The New Testament reading picks up Jesus saying something that we don't expect him to say that he's come to bring a sword and not peace. He's come to turn fathers against sons and daughters against mothers. It's a surprising and challenging message. How do we process that? One of the people who's writing, I really like Matthew Paris. He works for the BBC. He writes in the Times and looked after the BBC programme Great Lives, was brought up in Swaziland. His father was in the RAF and they travelled all around Africa. And so he was able to see at first hand people from different countries, different cultures, different backgrounds living together. And he had an insight which I'm going to share, which I think helps me to understand this passage. He said, at its worst, tribalism, which is really a version of communitarianism, stops people from being bold and taking a step out. He saw in the tribes, the villages, the communities, and we could add within the suburbs and with, within the churches and within family groups, there are aspects of life which are stifling and do not help people to stretch out and be all they can be. He is not a Christian, but he said he noticed where there were missionaries at work, it often helped the community because the missionary said that the individual was working with a higher authority and the local bonds, which could be restrictive, stifling, were broken. They were invited to think bigger and broader in a more generous way. His term is the tribe flattened, bound people up with conformity, and with fear and crushed the individual. That was tribalism at its worst. It is the family at its worst. It can be congregations at their worst. In this passage, Jesus is saying, we have to open out, broaden to be all we can be. That's what God calls from us. Jesus' most famous phrase is, I want you to have life, life in all its fullness. So the next hymn is a hymn which suggests that kind of challenge. It's a dynamic tune and a very powerful set of words. It shows Jesus being alone and stretched and looking for friendship. Hymn 360, Jesus Christ is waiting.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A child and its mother banished to the desert. This is a shocking story of human jealousy and callousness. Two little boys are playing happily together. The younger one is Isaac, the son of Abraham, and his chief wife, Sarah. The older is Ishmael, to a secondary wife named Hagar, a woman of another tribe who came into Abraham's household as a slave and gave birth so that Abraham could have children. Everything seems to be going well, but Sarah becomes jealous of her son's half-brother. They're at the stage where they're beginning to think about heirs, and Abraham and Sarah are old, and she thinks about the estate, and who's going to get the benefit of the land, and the money, and the cows, and the sheep. Her jealousy boils up until it cannot be contained, and she goes to her husband, and she makes her demand. Throughout this child of the slave woman, he has no right to be seen as your heir alongside my son, Isaac. Abraham isn't happy. He's not happy at all. He recognizes the jealousy, but after reflecting, he takes Hagar and Ishmael. He gives them some bread and a bag full of water, and he sends them out into the desert to their almost certain death. By all humanitarian values, this is a complete outrage. No wonder the critics of Judaism and Christianity enjoy the story, and it makes people like myself hugely embarrassed. Here, the great man of faith, the great couple of faith, Abraham and Sarah, who have heard God's call, who have taken the risk, who have left home and country and the known for the unknown. It's a couple of this quality who are now about to allow a small baby to die in the desert. Is this the kind of God we believe in? It fits the ugly world as we know it today. Racist jealousy, cruelty has not exactly been absent over these last years. Didn't we cover some of that last week here as we looked at Windrush? Ours is a world where it's easy to picture Afghanistan, Kenya, South Sudan, where a woman and child being given some bread and water and expelled into the desert. To read of it being perpetrated by Sarah and Abraham is shocking, obscene, worrying. But we better come to terms with it. God does not have perfect people with whom to work. He is stuck with folk like me and you. The church over the centuries has been accused of racism and brutality and abuse and is guilty on all counts. Returning to Abraham and Sarah, the love of God shines out in this story even against this ugly background of callousness. Let me remind you what happened. Hagar took her child, wandered into the wilderness. When the water was all gone, she couldn't bear to watch her child die, so she put him under a bush and she went the length of a bow shot from there. And she said, I cannot bear to watch the dying child. She sat there and she listened and the child cried loudly. 
Not a mother or father amongst us cannot feel distress as we think of Ishmael and the anguish of his mother. But a beautiful part of the story then unfolds. God heard the cry of the child and he gives a message. Don't grieve so deeply. Don't be afraid. I've heard the voice of your child and he enables Hagar to see a well of water and she goes and fills the water bag and gives the child a drink and God has a plan for the lad and he grows there in the wilderness and becomes an expert hunter with bow and arrow. God heard the voice of the child. And this is an important story because it is this point in this story in Judaism and Christianity and Islam that Christianity, Judaism and Islam split. And if you read the history of the Islamic faith, you'll know that Ishmael is a key character and a key leader leading down to the establishment of that new religion. And God saved the child. Here we have a glimpse of a God for whom all lives are precious. Forget Sarah and her cruel jealousy. We know of that. Focus on the God in the story who refuses to accept that the life of one child does not matter. This is the same God who pulls Moses and his basket out of the river. This is the same God who has Jesus born in a vulnerable stable in Bethlehem. This is the same God whose son comes with confidence and who says, one sheep matters, one coin matters, one prodigal son matters. And they're still forgiven and they're still loved. And we hear the New Testament reading afresh. Doesn't Jesus say, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your God knowing. Even the hairs of your head have been counted. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Jesus does not always say that he can save the sparrow from its fall. He says that the plight is registered in the soul of God. God feels every fall. God knows. God cares. God's love. That is why Christ comes. That is why Christ gives himself. We do not have an answer to why so many innocent suffer. The message is to assure us that God does listen, does care, does invite the Christian church to be a place where all children are included. It doesn't matter whether you're EH4673 or whatever your address. It doesn't matter who your parents are, what school you go to. It matters that you are made in the image of God and God hears your cry. God Here's the voice of the child. No human cry unheard. No tragedy that is not suffered by God. Not submarines going down. We believe in some way that there is a weaving into a final tapestry of beauty and love and joy. And even the strongest and the wisest and the most elderly among us are just as vulnerable as the children of God. With my heart, I believe and declare to you, God hears the cry of every child. Thanks be to God.
And now together and with song, we present ourselves afresh and bring our offerings to God. We stand and sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. <laughs> going to bring our prayers of thanksgiving and for others and you'll see on the prayer that there is a response the response is always the same line father your kingdom come it's in bold at the bottom of each slide and i invite you to join in with that as leslie and i share the prayer Let us come before God, let us pray together. Through Jesus, whom we confess as Lord, we give thanks and praise to the Father. Father, your kingdom come. Father, your, your kingdom, kingdom come. For all the peoples of the world on every continent, that they may know you as the God of peace, we pray to you, O Lord. Father, Father your, your kingdom, kingdom come. come for nations, for leaders and governments, that integrity may mark their dealings. We pray to you, O Lord, Father, Father your kingdom, kingdom come. For all who labor for fairness, that your presence and help may give them courage, we pray to you, O Lord. Father, Father your kingdom, kingdom come. come. For communities torn by dissension and strife, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Russia and Ukraine, that forgiveness may eventually bring healing and new opportunities, we pray to you, O Lord, Father, Father your, your kingdom, kingdom come. For the anxious, the lonely, the bereaved, that consolation and peace may be theirs. We pray to you, O Lord. Father, Father your kingdom, kingdom come. For our new church, now united as one household and family, that she may be firm in purpose and in hope. We pray to you, O Lord. Father, Father your, your kingdom, kingdom come. come. For Martin, Elspeth, and our elders, and for all who lead our children, that their lives may proclaim your glory, we pray to you, O Lord. Father, Father your kingdom come. For those who are separated from us by death, that theirs may be the kingdom which is unshakable, we pray to you, O Lord. Father, Father, your, your kingdom, kingdom come. O God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, make us perfect in all goodness to do your will, as we pray together in his name, saying, Our, our Father, Father, which art, art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
we try to bring together these thoughts and challenging thoughts today in this hymn. In Christ there is no east or west, in him no south or north, but one great fellowship of love throughout the whole wide earth. It's hymn 624. Now let us go in peace to share these great gifts of love and joy with those we meet and may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon us and all children everywhere from this day and forevermore. <laughs>